we're going to get started here. I would like to welcome everybody to our Zoom presentation today with Dr. Andre Panosian. He is going to give us some of his expert advice on facial paralysis, which does affect uh, many of our microtia children. Uh, Dr. Panosian is in uh, Pasadena and he deals with the facial paralysis and also vascular anomalies and uh, neurofibromatosis and different things. And in fact, he did even separate conjoined twins. So he is a man of many different talents and um, he's also been a speaker at our Iracles conferences. So we're super excited to have him. Dr. Lewin, would you like to add some comments? Sure, absolutely. So first of all, thank you everybody for joining our little live chat series. Um, I think it's important when you have a patient with microtia and uh, often there is an element of um, facial palsy to really get an expert to help you understand that. So um, Dr. Panosian and I go way back. He was uh, two years behind me in residency training at USC. And then he went on to specialize in uh, pediatric plastic surgery and craniofacial surgery at Toronto Sick Kids, so up in Canada. And then went a little south to go to Boston Children's for more specialized training in hand surgery for children. So as Tiffany mentioned, a man of many um, excellent uh, talents and, a, and an incredible surgeon, I can attest to personally having scrubbed with him. So we're super happy to have him here and uh, we'll let him teach us about nerve palsies related to microtia. Very cool. Thank you so much. I couldn't have done it better myself. <laughs> Thanks for the, the generous introduction. And yes, uh, Dr. Lewin and I have known each other for 20 years. Oh my <laughs> it's a pretty long time. Um, so yeah, so uh, I think uh, the way we should just do this is just start the talk, right? Okay. Sounds so great. let me go ahead and share my screen in just a second here. And that way we will all see what I'm seeing. Here we go. All right. Okay. My screen sharing is off. All right, Do you, are you guys seeing yeah, what I'm seeing? It's like kicking in, it's just taking a second. Okay. Oh, looks good. All right. All right I'm just gonna move everybody off to the side so I can see my screen. <laughs> Okay, so we're talking about congenital facial paralysis today, and it's specifically in relation to um, microtia and along the same lines, hemifacial microsomia is an element that we do see often associated with some form of a facial paralysis. Now, facial paralysis is um, going to be, whoops, let's go back. So facial paralysis is basically uh, damage or absence of the facial nerve. Facial nerve is the, we have 12 nerves in our, in our head and neck area that control everything uh, directly from the brain. And one of the ones is the facial nerve, it's the seventh nerve out of those 12, and it controls all the muscles of facial expression. And there are 20 or more of them in the face. And it could be one-sided, both sides. It could be, uh, partial or total. In other words, the whole side of the face may be out or just a portion or a few branches of the nerve can be out. It can be something called acute or chronic. Well, it doesn't really apply to congenital. And I sort of make that distinguishing characteristic between the two that it can either, kids can either be born with it or they can acquire it later on, for example, through trauma or something like that. Uh, now, the facial nerve, this is sort of where it is. It comes out from just underneath the ear uh, right where you feel the hard part of the bone, that that's the mastoid bone, and it comes right out in front of it and from that deep crevice. Comes in through this big salivary gland called the parotid gland, and it starts to arborize quite extensively into the face. And so we start off about with approximately five to six major branches, and then it divides further and further and further until it gets to thousands and thousands of little tiny branches as they feed all the muscles. So, and these come out of the brainstem, and as you can imagine, if you, if you damage any one of those trunks as you get further back towards the main part of the facial nerve, you'll get different presentations of facial paralysis from complete to just a little bit of weakness. So as we move on here, this is sort of a schematic showing 
all the muscles in the face, roughly all the muscles in the face, and there are over 20 of them. They, of course, they're, they have key functions. It's not just about moving the face, it's, it's protecting the eyes, it's about uh, closing the lips, which helps with speech and swallowing, and of course, uh, from a uh, psychological or sociologic standpoint, smiling is also affected, which is a really important part of being a human. So how do we diagnose it? It's not rocket science. If you're not moving the face, then you got some form of facial paralysis. It's some, uh, and when you're born with it, it can, it can be slightly different than if you got it later in life. Um, in other words, when, if you were fully functional from birth and then later on had a trauma, that looks different than when you were born with it. So we often just essentially base it off of uh, uh, what we call a clinical picture. So if it's based on the history and an exam, and, and we talk about other things like diagnostic studies. I know a lot of parents come to me already with, with uh, things like MRIs done and uh, uh, nerve conduction studies, which, is, which uh, I think are unnecessary a lot of times. I, ne I hardly ever look at these things, to be quite honest, because they don't really impact what I do. Uh, unless there's a brain tumor, obviously, but that is usually vetted before they, before kids get, get into my office. So in, in other words, you don't need to go out and request these studies to be done, or if your pediatrician just kind of doesn't know where to start, and then they start with these. It's sort of an unnecessary step in my book. I know a lot of people, including people who do this sort of work, will get them. I don't see the point, because if you're not moving the face, then you have some form of facial weakness or palsy. And, uh, and if it's happening from birth, then we do certain things uh, based on that presentation. So there's a bunch of different things that could cause facial paralysis. That's I'm not gonna go through them all, but uh, there's several obviously that happen at the time of birth uh, or in utero, and then lots of other things that can result in it. So specifically in terms of facial nerve palsy and microtia, often I get that question, how many people with Microtia will end up having some form of a facial nerve palsy. And I think the, the best study I've, I've found is back in 2018, Journal of Cranial Facial Surgery, a Chinese group had looked at a lot of patients with facial paralysis and hemifacial microsomia. And they basically said that there's about one in four uh, kids will have some form of facial nerve palsy, not complete paralysis, but maybe some weakness or some absent branches. Um, of the nerve, and that really mainly applies to hemifacial microsomia, um, and it really uh, corresponds to the development of the mandible, which is this lower jawbone, or in some cases with hemifacial microsomia, you get a lot of soft tissue shortage too, and they found that those two things were really strongly correlated with having some sort of a facial nerve palsy. Now, in relation to the uh, microtia part of it, in that study, they looked at how many patients had uh, Micro or anosha and uh, facial paralysis, and they found that the ones that were had absolutely no ear were obviously more prone to getting this facial paralysis, theoretically from not being able to, for, for whatever reason, it never developed the ear. Well, those same branches, embryologic origins didn't develop and, and form those facial nerve branches. And they saw that the orbital asymmetry, in other words, the eye socket position sometimes really strongly correlated with that. And then uh, the, the fact that, um, you know, sometimes you get some level of ear deformity and hemifacial microsomia as well was also mentioned. Now, how, how severe the microtia is and how, uh, how much of a facial nerve palsy you get is a really hard thing to quantify. And these are very, um, you, these are studies that look back on data. They don't look forward and follow up a cohort of patients. So there's limitations in that type of study, but it's a starting point in understanding, okay, well, how likely is, is my child going to have this facial paralysis problem? And then the, the way I look at the face is I split it into thirds. So the upper, middle, and lower third, and I look at it both at rest and with animation. So this is a dynamic function, whereas ears are, are more of a static uh, structure. This, this really involves nerves and muscles and it's really important to note both uh, states of animation, which is rest and, and moving. So as we look into it, we, we start looking at the upper third, which is the forehead area. And as, as you can see, the forehead is flat. It doesn't rise up. 
uh, in this area, you lose the wrinkling in the forehead uh, when that happens. And then in prolonged or long-standing cases of, of uh, upper third paralysis of the facial nerve, you'll start seeing drooping of the eyebrow and that drooping sometimes gets in the way of the vision and that's important to correct as well. In the middle third, we're really talking about eye closure. So when kids are trying to close their eyes, they obviously have a gap op uh, opening there and they got some sagging of the lower eyelid, ineffective upper eyelid closure. And that's because of that circular muscle that, that gives us the power to blink around the eye is, also, is partly, well, it's completely innervated by the facial nerve. So if it's knocked out, you're gonna see a picture like this where the uh, child's, child's unable to close the eye. Now there's a problem with that because you can, this is probably the most severe problem of facial paralysis that requires immediate attention is the eye because you don't want it to dry out. Uh, and if it dries out, you can get something called keratitis. And, and keratitis is a fancy word for scarring of the cornea and that can be permanent. So it's important to uh, make sure that the eye is always lubricated or protected somehow, whether it's through surgery or just just vigorous application of, of the uh, ophthalmic ointments. In the lower third, we're really talking about mouth movement uh, as the central feature and smiling is the most um, recognizable thing that's missing or asymmetric when, when we see it. Uh, with that said, we also have other things that have problems such as speech, speech issues. So a lot of kids, if you, if you notice how this child is trying to smile, the, the lower lip on the non-paralyzed side of the face pulls down, the upper lip pulls up so that you can see the teeth inside and everything else gets pulled over towards that side. So things like speech are affected. So people start to talk out of the side of their mouth more, which, is, which forms a habit. So we always wanna try to get symmetry back and balance back into the face, whether it's the mouth or the eyes or all that, uh, or any other function that's creating the asymmetry so that we don't develop these bad habits. And these are hard to break as time goes on. So I always try to get in, you know, when kids are still young. And by young, we were really talking about under 10 or 12 or something to that effect. Um, other things that are also affected are uh, the ability to propel food back. So when you're chewing the food in the front of the mouth and you're trying to swallow it back, there's muscles inside the cheek that sort of tense up so that the food doesn't pocket out into the mouth. And so it stays in the central highway of the mouth as it goes from the front to the back and down the esophagus. So that, is, that, that function is lost. So you get a lot of ballooning out, pooching of the cheek and food collecting in there. And so kids have to go in there with their finger and scoop it out uh, sometimes when that happens. So that's a problem. And then drooling because the, of the inability to properly close the lips. There's no uh, muscle tone in the paralyzed corner of the lip. And so you're really not able to, you know, force the mouth closed when that, that is happening. And we kind of want to address that as well. So what are the treatments uh, for facial paralysis? They really come down to the breakdown of my evaluation. We were looking at the upper third, the middle third, and the lower third. So this is an example of a kid with the upper, uh, upper third paralysis. Now, this is a uh, this is a kid who sustained a trauma. You can see the big giant scar on his forehead, but he knocked out the, uh, the branch which, uh, of the facial nerve that gives the ability of the forehead to lift up. So he's sort of a long-standing case. And of course, it's, it's, the eyebrow is lowered and it's weighing down the upper eyelid and you get, you get in this difference in the position of the upper eyelid and it's starting to block his vision. So we do basically a lift, a simple, brow lift, but we, there's different ways to achieve that. But uh, the way we do it is this, in this case, because he already had a scar there, we just made a scar uh, just at the margin of the eyebrow to lift it up. And then here at about a year later, he's got a pretty even balance to the upper eyelid, a fairly good position of the eyebrows. And that's basically what we're trying to shoot for, sort of a longstanding uh, solution. Now there's no active elevation that we can create in the, in the forehead. That, that's one of the questions I get asked from parents is that, how do you get more movement in the upper, uh, you know, in the forehead if you've got facial paralysis? And the answer to that is we don't. There's really not a great surgery for it. The people don't really, you know, clue into forehead function as much as smile function, for example. And if anything, there is asymmetry and we try to correct the asymmetry by balancing things. So we 
we can either lift up the eyebrow position. So this is just the resting state that you're seeing in this kid. But what we're trying to also do in the active state, you'll see the one side go up and down and the other side does nothing. And that's, that sort of draws the eye when, you're, when someone's talking to you. So in those instances, if it's a problem, and again, these are very subjective things. In other words, if the, the patient is very self-conscious about the forehead, then the, the solution to that is essentially going in and doing what, what's called a symmetry procedure, which is kind of purposely weakening the working side to balance with the opposite side. And when we do that, we do see some nice results come out of that. Um, and this is sort of a, a, a procedure that I do uh, sometimes, which is basically stripping out a piece of that frontalis muscle, which is the forehead muscle on the working side, not the non-working side, or we can do Botox as well to weaken it purposely to get the balance right between the eyebrows. When we do that, the asymmetry is vastly improved and that's more than enough for a lot of people. So movement, is, so that's basically a static procedure for facial paralysis. When we get to the middle third, we're talking about eyelid function and, and the inability to close the eyes. And, and by and large, we, all, we almost always recommend platinum weights if that's a problem. In other words, we put a, a small, tiny uh, weight that you see here. It kind of looks like this. It's flat, it's thin, um, and you stitch it to the uh, edge of the eyelid. And that helps weigh down the eyelid just enough to get a little bit more closure when, when there's purposeful eye closure trying to happen. Um, I'll, I'll mention uh, the eyelid levator swing uh, or spring, which I just mentioned it for historic reasons, but I probably uh, would not recommend that. I think over the years, there's been a lot of problems with these springs, and I've taken out a bunch over the years as well because of those problems. Uh, I never put one in, but uh, a lot of people, there was, it was a trend a while back. Um, levator lengthening is another procedure I do. It's a little bit more um, in, in line with using a, a child's own tissues, and that involves removing a little piece of fascia, or it's a lining of a muscle from some part of the body, and usually the easiest place is right over the uh, temporalis muscle, which is this muscle right here. It's a chewing muscle. It's super close to the skin, so we're able to open it up, take a little rectangle of it, and then we splice it into the area uh, between the eyelid margin and the working part of the eyelid. And when we do that, we are lengthening the eyelid so that it is able to travel further down without a weight or anything like that. So some people don't need that weight in those instances. For the lower eyelid, it's another matter. We wanna lift up on the lower eyelid. And that's again, a static procedure versus a dynamic procedure where we're trying to reroute a muscle or get more nerve function going. So what, what one of the things that we do is something called a tendon sling. And oftentimes we can use uh, a piece of tendon from some part of the body and that usually can come from the wrist. It's a little tiny incision that's made on the wrist and, the, and we, we target one of the tendons that people have that don't really get used a whole lot and, uh, and it's not really functional for any reason. And we take that, we take a small strip of that and we loop it as you see in this little schematic here and anchor it to the or eye socket basically on the outer part of the what's called the orbital rim. And simultaneously, we do something called a tarsorophy. We suture or stitch the corner of the eyelid together to give it a little bit extra support. Because when in facial paralysis, what happens is that the eyelid position might be good one year, and then over time it starts to drift lower and lower and lower as gravity and age kick in. So we're trying to resist that drop by putting a sling like this in. Now I've also uh, I've also been doing a different version. I haven't don't have it up here, but I'm hoping to write about it pretty soon. Is is, the, is using a piece of ear cartilage to splint the lower eyelid up internally because there are issues with this sling in terms of creating a clothesline in two dimensions and it doesn't really, it's, it improves or helps things but it doesn't really help 100% like I would like it to be. So this other technique involves using a piece of ear cartilage and basically splinting up the lower eyelid from an internally based incision, nothing external there. So, and I'm you know, happy to go into that further in the future if anybody wants to. Um, in the middle third, again, this is the eye eyelid function. So this is an example of a 16 year old 
um, who has this facial paralysis. And as you can see with gravity and time, the eyelid has dropped down pretty low. And when she tries to close her eyes, it's an incomplete closure. The eye, upper eyelid doesn't come down far enough like the other side. And the lower eyelid is just flat and low. So in her, we put in a platinum upper eyelid weight. And you can kind of see the shadow of it when she closes her eyes. Obviously, it's tucked away nicely when her eyes are open. And then uh, we also did the sling underneath the eyelid. And you can see the eyelid lower position has been slinged up so that when, you, when the finished product is done, then you essentially have less uh, white of the eye showing here. And that's, that's the goal, to get better eye protection through, the, uh, through that particular surgery. Now, we're talking about the lower third of the face. We're really sort of clued into the smile and lip function. And uh, there's different ways to categorize. Everyone's got a different smile, basically. You have a big toothy smile, and then you got a Mona Lisa type smile, and everything in between. So there's people try to, believe it or not, make classifications for this stuff. But at the end of the day, it's smiles and smiles. Whatever the smile is for an individual is, is unique to them. Um, lower th third correction. Uh, basically, when I'm talking about the lower third correction, we're really talking about the uh, muscles around the mouth. So when we have facial paralysis, like in uh, these kids, um, the working side actually pulls down. The non-working side doesn't pull down. That's the people think the opposite sometimes, that the lower side is the paralyzed side, which it isn't. So there's different ways to get symmetry of the lower lip, and that can be done in a couple of ways. One is to just basically simplest ways to Botox that area. Unfortunately, Botox is temporary. You got to repeat that. And it's hard to do that in children uh, for over and over and over again for many years. Um, in adults, they can tolerate it and they'll, they'll accept that uh, as an outcome. But in, in kids, you got to sort of start thinking outside the box a little bit if, uh, you know, we wanted more of a permanent result, in other words. So what I do is something called a myectomy. And I took the gross pictures out because those sort of show it a little bit better. But if we look at that last slide here of the, of the uh, mouth here, it's this muscle here, the group right in here, if everyone can see that. This is the muscle group that pulls the lower lip down. And we go through an incision inside the mouth. And then we take a strip of that muscle out and simultaneously uh, deaden the nerve to that muscle as well to get that muscle to stop working. Again, we're on the normal side, we're trying to do that because we really don't have a fantastic way of getting function back into the paralyzed side so that side starts to pull down. And it's similar to the forehead in the sense that you don't really need lower lip function as much as you need upper lip function. So um, you, you can get away with balancing the lower lip and still have a very nice result, even though it doesn't give you that big toothy smile. So this is, these are a couple examples of, uh, of these kids getting these procedures done to get balanced. Now, some of them also have facial reanimation. In other words, smile reanimation done. Actually, both of these examples have had it done where we've also lip, gotten some muscle into the upper lip to start making that move. And that improves the corner of the lip position simultaneously. So if you just went in there and just gutted out that muscle a little bit like I was showing, then it's not going to necessarily balance everything out because the corner of the, uh, of the paralyzed side is pulling in. So we got to do something to counter that force, and that is the smile reanimation. So the, when we're talking about smile reanimation, the, the vast majority of people out there use something called the gracilis muscle. It's a muscle in the inner thigh, and it, it's got a very... Uh, well-described blood vessel and nerve supply, which we can uh, take advantage of. We take a little small strip of it and implant it into the face, and we can either connect it to what's called a masseter nerve, which is a chewing, uh, uh, chewing nerve, which is usually not involved in uh, hemifacial microstomia, although it can be, uh, but it's usually not. Uh, or we do it in a two-stage fashion. So for example, if one side of the face is paralyzed, the other side's working fine, we can do put this extension cord of a nerve graft in there and uh, that comes from the leg and then we connect it to the normal side and we pass it across the upper side and then eventually do the second stage which is removing the muscle from the thigh and implanting it in the face and connecting it all up so that it all works spontaneously 
And this is an example of a two-stage reconstruction. Here's a little young lady who had paralysis, couldn't get it to move, and uh, we did the two-stage. So we took a nerve graft first, put it inside the normal side of the cheek, passed it across the upper side, and then followed that up with that gracilis muscle. And it's okay. I mean, it's not a fantastic result, but we get more movement in the corner of the mouth. It's almost symmetric movement in the corner of the mouth, but upper lip movement is, you know, it can be improved. So um, this is just an example. This is, act I show this mostly because I was frustrated with this surgery, because no matter who does it, no matter how good you get at this, there's some element of this picture happening. Plus, there is a lot of bulk in this cheek right here. If you notice the difference, a lot of people just focus in on the mouth instead of looking at the whole face. And if you realize by looking at the whole face, there's a there's greater volume in here. And this is just on the front view. There's still this, uh, you know, if you look at it from the side or bottom view, this is a giant cheek. So not a very great look. Here's another example of a two-stage reconstruction. That was that little girl who's our example. And uh, we did the nerve graft, followed up with a uh, a muscle graft and we simultaneously knocked out the nerve of the lower lip and then this is what we got out of it. Uh, just another example, now this one was connected, this is an adult, but it shows the gracilis muscle connected to that biting nerve, which is this, if you clench your jaw, you can feel that muscle move, that's the nerve we use. And, uh, and we followed up, uh, we basically did one surgery on her and this is where she ended up. And if you look at her actual movement here, and so she's really trying hard to smile. And after we do the surgery, she's got more movement, obviously. Now, again, I'm, I'm not terribly happy with that surgery because of this cheek. And also, if you notice, there's a weird dimple in the middle of the cheek. And it's, this is very frustrating to patients, believe it or not. That spot really is not a great spot for them. Um, we can do uh, the muscle transfer for Mobius syndrome, which, is, which involves both sides of the face. And again, I just show this again, and this was a gracilis muscle transfer. So I'm showing it just to show how cheeky these kids get. And it was, this was probably one of my very first kids that I redid this surgery on. And uh, I'm sitting there looking at this like everyone else. And I go, oh my gosh, look, you got nothing. And look at you now. But she was so unhappy and I couldn't believe it. I, I had to ask why. And she said she doesn't look, she doesn't like her look when she smiles. She looks like a chipmunk. So that really hit home with me. And I thought, well, there's got to be a better way. And so, and I'll get into that a little bit, but this is her video of when, you know, before and then uh, after she had both of them done, she's got good control, but look how cheeky she is. She's huge. So I didn't blame her for getting really upset about it. So it just sort of led me down the road to look at a different option. And um, there, there was, uh, there's a muscle on the side of the head called the temporalis. And in, it's, a, it's not a new technique to use that muscle for facial paralysis, especially when we're trying to do uh, reanimation of the smile. People have tried to flip it over uh, the arch of the bone here and you know, drag it towards the corner of the mouth, but it's, it creates a secondary deformity up here it hollows out that area, plus it never really quite works right, and it needs another graft on top of that to make it work, and it's just, it's just not a great surgery overall. Although some people will still offer that out there, and I, I just don't know why, but that's the, that's the case. But what I, my take on it was, and it's not, and credit goes to Dr. Labbe in France, really, who uh, really started to look at that muscle again in a different way. Instead of flipping it over, he said, well, why don't we slide it underneath the skeleton of the face and thereby avoid that deformity that it creates up there and take advantage of that muscle function, being that it's an analogous function. In other words, when we bite, it simulates, that's the closest thing we have to actual smiling that is not powered by the facial nerve. So we, we, take, that as a, uh, we take that analogy of muscles and we use it to our advantage. So in this, uh, in this uh, particular paper that I wrote, we basically move that muscle down, we sacrifice the posterior half or the back half of the muscle so that we can get length from the front part of the muscle so that it reaches the corner of the mouth and then we connect it all up. And then when they go to bite, they can actually trigger that muscle to rise and create a smile without having to undergo this gracilis muscle, without having the bulk and all these other problems with dimpling uh, that were happening.
And so here's a little guy with microtia who uh, basically has a partial nerve palsy. You can see when he's trying to smile, he's got no movement of the upper lip. He's got some movement of the of the corners of the mouth, but no fold formation. You can see a nice lap. Bring the eye symptom of uh, of basic dry eyes and paralytic. Um, his brow a bit lower, uh, but you, you would see uh, as he blinks, uh, he would have a problem with that color too. So we did his temporal smile, as we call it. Um, his result 10 months later, he's from Ecuador, so I couldn't get him back here for a follow up, but mom sent me these pretty poor pictures showing him, showing us what uh, that all looked like as he smiled been able to show teeth before. Now he's showing it pretty, I mean, with fairly good result. And here's a, another uh, patient here we did as well. And this is her only about a month or two after surgery, and she's still getting the hang of it. So she, if you notice, it's not 100% movement, but it's quite a bit more movement than she started with, which is here. And and even if the muscle didn't move much, you're actually getting good repositioning of the corner of the mouth, which is a big deal. Here's another kid who had that done. And this is her smiling afterwards. And she, and I think this is more of a three month, and then there's one more at, at a year out showing how she's moving her face. And these are all from my YouTube channel. Feel free to go in there and look at them in greater detail. But this is her after about a year when she's trying to smile, she's able to trigger it and she's got good individual activity. They learn to do it. And it's not perfect. You look at her trying to pucker or whistle. It doesn't completely close the mouth, but it's a vast improvement. She's able to get tight lip closure again, which wasn't happening before. So that's a, that's sort of the uh, a benefit of that. Now, this is a kid with something called Mobius syndrome. And we basically did both sides at the same time. So where that's the advantage, one of the advantages of this technique is that you move the muscles down simultaneously and you're able to implant them through the incisions in the lap lines to get them to move. And this is yet another one. He, this is the patient, again, this is, he's only got one-sided Mobius syndrome and he's trying to smile. And of course he can't do a proper smile. And then afterwards, after we did his surgery, he's able to just get some really nice little movements Again, he's got, he's got good control and he's, he's very diligent about working to retrain the muscle, but it's, it's really helpful. And if you notice the scar healed very nicely in, in him as well. So this leads me to the next question is, what about these scars? What do they look like? Well, they are scars that have to go into the laugh line areas. They basically are there in order to visualize the end of the muscle and to also help us implant that accurately into the corner of the lip where we want it to go so that when it triggers, it moves it symmetrically. Um, it heals very well. And as you can see in these little kids, it actually heals very nicely. There's uh, the scalp incision. You can see it. it. This is it. It starts over here near the temple, goes up and around the sideburn, and then sort of stops somewhere behind the ear. And, um, and uh, it heals very nicely. It's hidden by hair. Uh, a lot of people who, including Dr. LeBay, who I trained with for this technique, does a big zigzag incision across the top of the scalp. And those have problems, especially in boys who keep their hair short. It gives you a, a, a patch of baldness along the scar, which is not great. Uh, so it, there's a lot of downsides to it uh, but about making that uh, incision there. So I modified it quite a bit. And I'm able to do through a little bitty incision now. Uh, without having a, a big, large scar out of it. And here's another example of those scars. So here's a temple scar, and then here's the laugh line scar there. So what are the benefits? Just as a recap on that, we, we get less cheek bulk. If you notice in all those pictures, these kids have minimal cheek bulk, if any, uh, because the muscle is actually below the skeleton of the, of the face. In other words, if you put in the gracilis muscle, we have to put it on top of the skeleton of the face. In the temporalis, we, we channel it or tunnel it underneath the, in, uh, the bulk or the skeleton of the face. And so you don't see any of that dimpling because it's basically a direct shot right towards the uh, laugh line area. 
and has no opportunity to dimple in the middle of the cheek. It is much shorter in operative time. It takes me about four hours to do one side usually, up to five hours, just depends on anatomy. Um, uh, we could do both sides like I, like I showed you with that other kid with Mobius syndrome. We could do them both simultaneously if we need to. And the, one of the greatest benefits is we do this as an outpatient. So I go on medical missions and I do this uh, abroad. Um, and I try to teach the local docs how to do this as well um, because it's just so amenable to it compared to the gracilis muscle, which actually needs an ICU stay, uh, brief hospitalization, and you can't do both sides at the same time. You got to do one side, then the other. And of course, you got that bulk issue as well. Um, so what are the risks? Well, you got usual risks of surgery, which include bleeding, infection, problems with anesthesia. Anytime in plastic surgery, we're doing a, any type of plastic surgical procedure, we're always talking about how the scar looks. Some of it's genetically driven, ethnically driven. Some of it is technique driven. Uh, and others are in unforeseen problems, such as kids running around, falling down, hitting, you know, brother hitting them in the head or something like that, splitting open the scar, and then you end up with a little bit of a bad scar. Uh, we can correct those, but uh, that's po a possible risk. Retraining of the muscle is required. It's not that it's a risk. I throw it under here just because I didn't want to put another slide up, but it's, uh, we're trying to retrain these muscles. This is a muscle for biting. We're not, uh, we're, it's not a normal muscle for smile. With that said, kids who have this done very early on, we're thinking around less than 10 years of age, um, they do really well without much therapy at all to get this to work as a normal smiling muscle. The brain sort of reorients in the, uh, in the upper hemispheres and, and says, okay, this, this is now how I smile. And I've, I've got a series of videos of patients and I always ask them on video, now tell me your technique for smiling. What are you doing? Every so often you, you get someone saying, oh, I have to bite to make it happen. But usually almost, I would say that's a very small handful, but most of them say, I don't know, I just smile and then it just happens, which is what you wanna hear. You don't wanna sit there and go, okay, well, it's not great because they have to now bite to make them smile. So what's the point of that, you know? But, but they actually relearn and it has to do with what we call cortical plasticity. Little kids are more malleable in that sense and can retrain these muscles without much effort. Um, asymmetry can be a problem. So when we do one side, uh, or even when we do both sides, there, it's a dynamic process. So one side might pull harder than the other, or um, one, one anchoring suture might come loose underneath the skin on one side than the other, which could create some asymmetry. Or it could be that handedness has to do with it. If you're right-handed, your right side might pull a little harder than your left. So there's a lot of differences uh, that come in. Usually there's an improvement. And in the human experience, if you have some movement for a smile, even though it's asymmetric, it's more, uh, it's less uh, distracting to people that you're talking to as opposed to having no movement or very little movement. And so, there, so getting some motion is better than no motion at all. Um, and then, of course, you get undercorrect or overcorrect. Overcorrecting is more rare, even though most kids are overcorrected immediately after surgery. They just what we call autocorrect afterwards because if they have one side that's working, it's almost like a balance. So it's like a, the pendulum is kind of trying to settle in those cases. And then eventually it does. Uh, Undercorrection, so that is a, sometimes a possibility if the muscle is not very strong or in the incredibly rare instance where the nerve is damaged or very deficient, then you can potentially undercorrect the problem, in, in which case you gotta think of a different option. Uh, so when do we do surgery? Usually prior to school age, so that we, most things in plastic surgery, we're trying to fix everything before kids start school. And that's the way we, uh, we do it, whether it's for hand stuff or for facial stuff. They, I like to make sure that kids look as good as they can be before they start kindergarten. And that's sort of, uh, I think, a very general concept. Um, you sometimes have to intervene sooner if there's symptoms. So for example, if there's really severe drooping of the eyelid that's causing blockage of the vision, that's a problem, we gotta fix that. Or if, the, or if you, you got absolutely no movement of the eye to protect it, then you gotta fix that if, that's, if it's severe enough and if you have some signs of drying out. With that said, most of these eye symptoms can also wait or be temporized by using lubricants 
you know, aggressively, vigilantly, uh, to not let the eye dry out, and until the kids are older and can have surgery safely in a more permanent fashion. And uh, in relation to microtia reconstruction, we do it after ear reconstruction, not before, and that has to do with um, the area we're working. Uh, we are going through the nice, healthy piece of tissue that Dr. Lewin loves to use, including its blood vessel, whenever we're going through in and into that space. It's really hard to necessarily separate that layer away and in a very gentle fashion. It's possible, but it, it's, you really wonder about its robustness after you've done something like that. Um, so I always say, let's not chance it. We do ear reconstruction first, which can happen even earlier uh, than when I do the muscle. So it actually just works out. So, so it doesn't need to be that uh, we have to do the facial paralysis part first and then jump to the ear because it is definitely sort of out of order. And that's all I have for that. I just want to stop there, see if you guys have any questions, and then go from there. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Super informative. Um, we do have one question right away um, from Deanna. Um, mm -hmm. My daughter has right side facial paralysis and cannot blink her eye. I was wondering what we should be doing right now to protect the eye as well as if there's a surgery available that would allow the eye to blink even though she is missing a seventh facial nerve and if there is a surgery what age she would be eligible. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so it kind of hit, hits that last point that I was making and it really has to do with uh, when is surgery optimal in kids. I think eyelid surgery specifically. I mean, eyes are important. So you do it when you have a symptom, when it's really, when the eye is showing problems. In other words, pain in the eye, drying out, excessive tearing. Um, and an ophthalmologist needs to follow that as well to see if there's any of this scarring of the cornea. And if it's happening, we just, we have to bite the bullet and do it as soon as possible. Sometimes as early as 10 months of age or sometimes as, as um, or, or whenever. So we just have to basically uh, treat the problem that's in front of us um, at the time when it comes to the eyelid. But if we can wait, and we and most people can, by using uh, eye lubricants, things like lacrolube and artificial tears, and, and you can really kind of temporize that problem for years before you have to do something, which is actually a, a preferred way to go about doing that. Because if you, if you try to do surgery early, there, there's, kids are growing rapidly. So you're doing something that might not work in a year from that, that point. So you wanna to get to a more stable level and on not, not only for that purpose, but also to make surgery safe. So uh, the old, slightly older you are, the, the, the decreased risk of these types of surgeries under anesthesia. Uh, but in the, in, to answer that question is, uh, more closely is that uh, you'd want to use at the very least uh, lubricants for the eye and also have an ophthalmologist on top of it, constantly following possibly every six months or so for an eye exam. And uh, as long as it's, there's no signs of a corneal scarring situation, that can go on indefinitely until we're ready to get that fixed. But I will say one thing that kids with congenital facial nerve paralysis or eye problems related to facial nerve paralysis are not as severely affected as those who actually had it later in life. So for example, if someone had a trauma or Bell's palsy and they knocked it out completely, they're in worse shape than kids who are born with it. And that's just, we don't know why, but that possibly has to do with uh, compensation that happens at, at birth or genetically or whatever, what have you. I don't think anybody really knows. But it's, it's the observation that I've had over the years is that their problems can, are not that bad. Because a lot of these kids, especially with Mobius syndrome, can't close all their eyes, both of their eyes. And they're they always have a gap of, uh, open. Well, there's a couple things that happen. One is that the eye naturally rolls up whenever you try to blink or try to close your eyes, especially like when you go to sleep, your eye rolls up a little bit. And so that's a protective mechanism. And then uh, that, that can help. And then the other thing is that for whatever reason, the kids have habituated or something to that effect where they can protect their eyes sufficiently that they don't get those problems as much. So you don't need as... Uh, you know, vigilant uh, an application of uh, lubricant as you need for a Bell's policy patient. Okay, great. I have a question also for Dr. Panosian, a little bit to do with what you were just referring to, but 
specifically for a facial paralysis that is in a patient with microtia, do you feel like there's a tendency for that paralysis to stay the same from birth till adulthood um, to improve or to worsen over time? Is there any pattern to that? Yeah, I think it's, it's proportionate. And again, congenital situation is different from an acquired situation. And in a, in the, let's just start with the acquired one. So someone with Bell's palsy who is, has a totally fully working face all of a sudden has paralysis and they regain part of it, but not all of it, it actually looks worse as time goes by. Whereas in congenital paralysis, it's pretty stable throughout. And we don't know why that is. It doesn't sort of, you know, the eyelid, for example, doesn't drift further down. The, you know, the eyebrow doesn't necessarily fall further. Uh, but it doesn't good. improve either. Good yeah. for our patient population, but exactly, yeah. exactly. But but I, well, but the point to make is that it doesn't improve either, from right. what I've seen. So I I have a lot of patients or families who come in and they say, okay, well, you know, we we got most of we on one side we're almost completely paralyzed, but we got one little thing that does this over here. Can what can that you know? And they hang on to that hope as though the rest will come back, and it just doesn't do that. In reality that piece or that sprig of nerve just made it through and that and that's usually only in the congenital situation uh, that it came through and it met joined up with a piece of muscle and it worked and then and it just it's a and it's usually the lower branch and it and it does may, mainly either lower lip depression or just a little lateral movement of the lip it's right. hardly ever upper lip movement without you know any lower lip problems that sort of thing yeah so yeah thanks um, questions. Great. Yeah, we have a question from Reagan. Insurance. Is this considered cosmetic to insurance companies? No, no. And if it is, you got to ask for your case uh, worker, basically. If you're getting that stone wall happening, you got to ask for a case manager to get on it and explain themselves because this is absolutely covered by all insurance companies. Um, yeah, I've yet to have a problem with it. So, uh, but there, you know, we, you never know. Insur the insurance business in America is really finicky. And then one, one month, one insurance is fantastic. It covers everything under the sun. And the next month, they don't want to cover, you know, necessary surgery. So it's just, you know, it's one of those uh, strange things that happen. Yeah, in America. we love insurance. It's a blast. It's uh, <laughs> um, another submitted question here from Marcy. Do you offer Skype or telemed? And when we, if we would come out for surgery, how long would we be there? Good question. So um, basically, uh, yes, absolutely. I do tons and tons of Skype. Um, we've jumped all over different platforms. We're onto Zoom now because it uh, seems to be a little bit more intuitive. You don't have to download apps and you know, all these strange things and logins and things like that. So you can just click a link and do it and it just seems to work. So we, we do Zoom consultations. And uh, it's very streamlined. So I usually leave about an hour to do these consultations. Um, I also request some photos ahead of time, some still photos with good lighting and high definition because sometimes it's grainy on the, uh, on the videos. And I wanna be able to really kind of do an exam as though you're here in this office. So that's sort of the, 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 the way I do it. Um, and then if you, Let's just, and we do have constantly people coming from out of state, out of country to get this surgery done. Um, they will, I always just recommend if they can come in and, and stay at the minimum two weeks, that would be ideal. We, that's sort of, in my experience, the, the length of time where any complication, if it were to happen, happens in that time period. With that said, maybe two patients over eight years time has had that issue. So where, where we had to do something to relieve an infection or something like that. But, that. but most people are ready. I mean, most of the swelling is gone by a week. Most, of the, most kids have very little pain anyway, so they are able to go home. Um, and, and theoretically, you could go home in about three, four days. But um, I, I'm still a little conservative with that. I like to make sure that people are around because honestly, not enough people are doing the surgery out there for me to say, oh yeah, you should go to so-and-so if you're in Seattle or so-and-so in New York. It just doesn't work that way. They, nobody really does this particular surgery the way I like to do it. So I can't 
nor, you know, I can't uh, entrust someone sight unseen or, you know, I didn't. You and I are the same way that way, Dr. Panosian. Oh. We, we're both in the same boat. But I just like to add, um, for those of you that aren't familiar with Los Angeles, if you are happening, say, to come out for surgery with me, anyways, um, we are very happy to set up in the time in the two weeks you're in LA with me. It would be very easy to have an in-person consultation. Um, Pasadena and Torrance are maybe an hour in traffic apart from each other, but um, we work together very well. So we're happy to have our families meet with you in person, which I think is the best way to, you know, if possible, um, get an understanding of your options regarding the nerve palsies. Absolutely. I 100% encourage people to do that. In fact, if they are coming out here for a consultation to do that. Perfect. I have a quick question. I was wondering, so for this um, facial paralysis surgery, how common is it to need a follow-up surgery? That's a good question. So in that paper I wrote in the beginning, that was a few years ago now, it's about um, four or five years ago now that I put that paper out there. I had a quote unquote revision rate of 60%. And that's really high. And I, I didn't hide that fact. In, in the fact, I wanted to show that this is still an evolving procedure back then. Um, but as I went forward from that grouping of patients, and even during the, as the paper was being accepted, I was doing way less revisions. And now I haven't done a revision on any of these kids in maybe four years, I would say. We've done um, we've done two cases where there was a little infection near the, uh, the laugh line incision where we had to just drain the infection and just re-anchor the muscle down. And that worked out fine and kids did well. But the, one of the things that we've noticed with that, with this technique is that when we do it, it's a, the muscle, we're asking this muscle to stretch. And when muscles try to get moved from their uh, original location and we're asking them to stretch and do something else, they actually go into spasm right away. They don't automatically just jump and start to move and perfect smile and all that stuff. It actually takes some time for the muscle to reset into its new position. So it has to heal to where we took it from and where we insert it into. And it's got to start jiggling a little bit. So I'll often have kids start chewing gum after surgery just to get the muscles just cranking so it jiggles. And so so you don't want it bound up by scar inside the face. So the scar can constantly form around the muscle. So we want it moving. Uh, with that said, that spasticity lasts weeks sometimes. Not, it doesn't just go away. It, the muscle's relearning where it needs to be and how to move. And, and that just takes time. And, and what was leading to the revisions at the beginning, I think, was an erroneous observation where I didn't see as much movement as the other kids, so we had to just kind of revise it. Something was bind, binding it up. But a few kids kind of slipped through the cracks and were scheduled for revision, and then for whatever reason, they were sick or got canceled. And then they came back a month or two later, and it was beautiful. Everything is working. And so it was just one of those serendipitous moments where you're kind of like, oh, thank God. <laughs> because, and then all of a sudden, you know, when we were seeing very little movement in the beginning, we were starting to see more and more and more movement and it just grew and grew and grew so that you're not done with the full range of motion even after a year you're actually building on it i've seen kids back two three four years i have a uh, i have a 15 year old kid coming back who i who's one of the who's that mobius kid that we did the both sides on he's coming back and he looks great he wanted to meet me because it's been so many years <laughs> We did the surgery that, you know, he just wanted to come and say hi and thank me and whatnot, but which is really cool to see. But but he has built over, you know, seven, eight years, this ability to really kind of control the muscle and move. And it's life changing for kids. It really is. The ability to move the cheek in a, any fashion of smile is, is better than zero. So Definitely. that's why we do it. Well, we are up with our hour time limit, so we do want to thank you for giving us your time today and presenting for our families. Um, as you guys all know, they will be um, recorded, uploaded to, well, it has been recorded, and we'll upload it to YouTube and link it on our live chat page, so we'll make sure to send that out. A um, lot of detailed information, so you'll be able to review it. 
Um, the website was put in the chat, but it is drpanosian.com. And then the facial paralysis links are drpanosian.com slash facial dash paralysis. If anybody, Dr. Panosian did put his contact information up there, but if anybody you know needs it again, feel free to reach out to us. You know how to um, get to us and we'll you know send you on your way to Dr. Panosian and set up any consultations you know through his office. Um, a little message from Shannon. Thank you very much. This was super informative. So really appreciate all that feedback and we hope you join us for a future live chat. So. Thank you guys. All right. Thank you. See you guys. Bye. Bye.